Good morning, everyone. Kevin here from Skywatcher, and welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. Now, uh, it is the beginning of April. Uh, welcome to the first episode of the What's Up webcast for April, and we're doing April night skies as we do at the beginning of every month. Um, I will preface, though, that this is a pre-recorded episode because if you are if we are watching this, uh, the Skywatcher team is out in Texas for the Texas Star Party uh, Total Solar Eclipse event. Uh, the Total Solar Eclipse is literally around the corner. Um, so it is on Monday. This airs on April 5th. Um, so it is Monday. Uh, so you've got just a couple days to get your affairs in order and get ready to get out there and take some awesome pictures and just experience this event, whether you're going to be in totality or whether you're going to be just viewing it in a partial phase, it's worth getting out there and seeing it. Of course, if you like what you see here at the What's Up webcast, please go ahead and subscribe. Uh, there's a large majority of you out there that are not subscribed to the channel, so please support us by going over there and just hitting subscribe. And if there's a video you like, please leave a like on one of those videos. It does a long, uh, it does a lot to going a long way uh, to making sure we can keep this whole thing going. Now, if you have ideas for a future episode, please email us at info at skywatchusa.com and title it What's Up and uh, we're always looking for ideas for future webcast episodes. Uh, if you want to keep up to date with what's going on at the webcast or any sales or anything like that or wherever we're going to be, uh, go to skywatchusa.com, click up at the top, subscribe and save, and you can join our email list um, right there, and it'll keep you up to date with everything that's going on here at Skywatcher uh, here in North America. Uh, so, uh, real quick, before we get going, uh, if you want to support the channel a little bit more, you can head over to skywatcher.threadless.com, pick up some cool swag to match your pro Skywatcher products or anything else that you might be looking for. Uh, we've got all kinds of cool little things up on that store as well. Um, we still have the limited edition Virtuoso GTI. We are sold out currently. Uh, there's another shipment on its way here soon. But you can also get over there to any of your favorite dealers, and uh, some of them do have them in stock as well. So you can pick those up while they are still available. All right, so let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, obviously, the bright thing in the nighttime sky is the moon, and we always start out with the moon. Of course, new moon is April 8th. Now, when I was putting this together, we don't normally have a total solar eclipse, so it didn't even cross my mind. Um, just with everything else going on, I had to look up, when's the new moon for April? It's April 8th, because that's when the moon is covering the sun. So, new moon. Um, so, yes, new moon is April 8th, um, Monday. So, of course, this weekend um, is going to be the dark sky weekend, the 6th and the 7th. So, if you're heading out to the eclipse... Um, maybe you're going somewhere dark and you can do some viewing while you're out there, maybe some astrophotography, um, or if you're just going out to have a good time and enjoy dark skies, this is the weekend to do so, uh, April 6th and 7th. And of course on Monday, April 8th, you get the eclipse. So it's kind of a cool thing. Now, full moon, uh, full moon's at the end of the month. We're at April 24th. Um, I'm sorry, that shouldn't say the warm moon. That should say the pink moon. Um, uh, the full moon for April is always known as the pink moon. That's because there's a plant called the ground follix. Um, a, I'm an astronomer, uh, not a biologist. Um, but uh, this particular plant blooms this time of year and it has pink flowers and that is how the full moon of april gets its name known as the pink moon now if you ever want to know more about the stories behind the full moons um, or why the full moons have certain names go over to timeanddate.com uh, that's a fantastic website um, they tell you all about eclipses and stuff i'm sorry time and date is a great website for all kinds of eclipse information and moon and stuff but uh, farmers almanac is a great website as well that tells you all the history and folklore behind all the full moons. And if you do a lot of outreach like myself, it's a kind of a fun little topic to bring up um, with people on why the full moons get their name and the cultures behind that. So it's a pretty cool little thing there. 
planets. So for planets, I like to bring up Stellarium. Now, if you're not familiar with Stellarium, Stellarium is a free planetarium software or program or an app. Um, and it's available on multiple platforms, but you can do telescope control with it. I just like to use it as a little planetarium software. It's a great little program uh, to use if you just want to get out and see what's going to be going on. Uh, Sky Safari is my personal favorite, especially if you're on like a mobile device. But here at home um, and in the studios and stuff like that, using it right here on the computer, it's a good way of just seeing when things are going to be up, when the sun's setting, all that fun stuff. So um, as for planets right now, all we have right now is Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter is very low in the west uh, and... Honestly, that's kind of the end of our uh, planets for spring. Uh, a lot of this stuff is going to roll back around in the fall, and we'll have Mars up as well. So when it comes to the planets, there's not a lot up right now. If you're going to be in the path of totality, um, you will see a collection of planets up in the sky. Um, so let's head over to April 8th. Obviously, this is set for Arizona because that's where I am I live, but... Um, yeah, so there's the moon, there's the sun, um, but at that time, um, there's going to be a fair amount of planets up. We'll have Jupiter, Saturn's kind of floating up there somewhere, uh, uh, Venus is there, Mercury should be there, but you're going to get quite a collection of planets going across the night, or not the night sky, across the sky during totality, so... If you're going to be in the path of totality, it's clear it might be cool to get a really wide angle lens and shoot a wide angle picture of what's going on in the sky at that time. So something uh, cool to be there as well. So, But right now for the evening, uh, planets are pretty much done. You can still get a, a glimpse of some of them in the early morning hours. Um, but right now uh, we are pretty much done with the planets. Uh, for the season at least and we'll have to wait until autumn comes back around where more of these planets will become visible the sun um so the sun is we are inching closer and closer um obviously to the eclipse which is on monday however just because april 8th is over in a few days we are still inching into solar maximum which is actually 2025 so if you have solar telescopes, particularly hydrogen alpha telescopes, because they have the most dynamic view of the sun, um, there is a ton of stuff to see daily. And if you want to get out there and see what's going on, I like to use uh, Gong. Uh, so just Google G-O-N-G-H alpha, and it brings you to here. Now, this was recorded on March 28th, so the dates here are going to be March 28th. Um, these change every day multiple times a day you can see big bear just updated um, but there's a lot of cool stuff going on there's a big active region right here there's some really impressive filaments um, and all kinds of detail going on so uh, plus sunspots so if you're into the sun uh, now's a great time to be observing the sun uh, as long as you're using the right filters and in the past we have done plenty of episodes especially having just wrapped up all of March, which was pretty much all about the sun. We have multiple episodes here at the What's Up webcast to talk about um, observing the sun safely, but hydrogen alpha, solar hydrogen alpha filters or dedicated telescopes are going to give you the most dynamic view of the sun, and you have a chance to get out there and check it out. I highly recommend it. But Everything on the sun is constantly changing, and as we are in solar maximum right now, there's prominences, there's plages, there's spicules, filaments, uh, sunspots. There's a lot to get out and observe. So just because the eclipse is over in after April 8th doesn't mean the sun gets boring. If anything, it is anything but that. Um so don't go and sell all your solar filters and stuff just because the eclipse is over. Um, get out there and observe the sun. Just make sure you're doing it safely and with the proper equipment. And if you have no idea what you're doing, we have plenty of episodes here that talk about the variety of filters that are available. Um, and you can always talk to many of the solar companies because once this eclipse is done, things should calm down and get back to normal for them and they'll be easier to get a hold of. Now, of course the eclipse uh april 8th monday 
is the total solar eclipse. This is the last total solar eclipse visible in North America for about 20 years. Um, so this will be the time to get out and see it. Make sure you are equipped and ready to go. This weekend will be the last time that you have to get this ready to go. Um, so please make sure you know what you're doing. Make sure the filters are right. Make sure you know your focal lengths, exposures, everything. Make sure you are ready to go um, so you get a good view and enjoy this event. And ultimately, please make sure that you take the time to enjoy this event. Um, I've seen one other total solar eclipse and they are the most amazing things to actually see and witness. So please make sure you actually enjoy it and as awesome as it is to take pictures and you want to show everyone, don't forget to take time for yourself and just be in that moment and enjoy it. Um, but we have plenty of episodes here. If you've not been watching the What's Up webcast the last month, we have been doing dedicated um, eclipse prep videos. So if you are not ready or you need to refresh, please go back and watch those episodes. You've got a couple days before the eclipse um, at the uh, before this goes down. So please enjoy that. Uh, meteor showers. Uh, meteor showers. Uh, we actually have the Lyrid meteor shower. This is at the end of the month. April 21st and 22nd are the peak dates. Um, one thing about this is the full moon, remember, is on the 24th. So this the Lyrid meteor shower for this year is not ideally placed um, with the moon cycle. So you're going to have a very bright moon to contend with. So you'll probably only get the brightest meteors that you could see in there. So just uh, be aware of that. But the Lyrid meteor shower is uh, the big one for this month. And again, it's at the end of 21st and 22nd are those dates there. We're going to pass through this episode very, very quickly. Um, comets. Um, so right now, actually, let me see if I can bring this up. Hold, please. Um, the big comet lately has been Comet 12P uh, Pons Brooks. And this is the comet that we've been wanting to keep an eye on for the eclipse because there is a possibility that we might be able to grab it during totality. Um, I don't think it's going to be bright enough to actually go and see it. Uh, but here's my shot of 12P Pons Brooks uh, right there. Uh, this was captured uh, in our remote observatory with a friend's telescope. This is a Stellar V180 um, refractor and a ZWO6200 uh, color. Um, but that is 12P Pons Brooks. Uh, it is very low right now. I think it's actually even gone out of the evening sky at this point, but it's inching its way closer. I don't think this will be visible in totality. Um, it would be really cool if it was, uh, but I guess we're going to see. But it is just under uh, naked eye visibility last I checked. Um, but that means you need some pretty dark skies to actually see it at night. And during totality, there frankly just is, it's not dark enough. But we could be presently surprised. So um, 12 P Pons Brooks during the eclipse, if you're in totality, is going to be not far from Jupiter. Uh, let me see if we can find this. So 12 P. It doesn't want to come up. I'm sure there's a way to do it, and I am not doing it right. Interesting. I would have thought it would have brought it up. Um, but yeah, Jupiter is over here. There's Jupiter. So 12 P. Pons Brooks during totality is going to be probably just over to the left of it a bit, if I remember correctly um, from looking at everything else. But so that's something that you want to pay attention to. If you're using a wide angle camera, you can give it a go. Um, I'm curious to see if someone's going to try and get it and dedicate it, but I would rather try to shoot the Corona than deal with trying to shoot a comet um, during totality. So uh, 12P Pons Brooks has been that bright comet and it, it looks pretty cool, uh, but I think it's pretty much done uh, for the Northern Hemisphere at the moment. But if you ever wanna know more about comets and what's up right now, go over to cometchasing.skyhound.com. 
Um, great website gives you all the rundowns of everything. Um, it did have a uh, Pons Brooks did have a uh, outburst right here on February 29th, um, but right now it's kind of, it's still cruising around, but um, they have a video on it and stuff like that. So right now it's magnitude 6.7. Um, that is technically within naked eye visibility, but you probably need like binoculars or something like that um, to catch it. But uh, with this cometchasing.skyhound.com website, you can go through all the different visible comets that are up. It tells you what's up, um, any notes on it, things like that. Here's the finder chart. Um, so we can see right here for it doesn't even go out to April yet because as of recording, they haven't released the April notes yet. But you can see by the end of the month, it's going to be in Aries right here. Um, so it could be interesting during totality. Just we won't know. So, uh, But there's a bunch of notes here for all the major comets here. You can see there's a few of them up here right now. 12P is obviously the brightest at 6.7. We have a morning comet uh, at 9.7, so that's telescopic. Um, anything below about 7th magnitude is requiring optics to capture and observe it. So, um, But there are plenty of awesome uh, comet options here if you're into comets and you want to go out and see what's going on. Uh, here's a complete list of them and all the notes. There's a lot of visible comets right here for the Northern Hemisphere. Some of them are fairly faint, but um, some of these are good imaging targets. So if you want to go out and give them a shot, there's like nearly a dozen here so uh one two three four five six seven eight nine comets currently visible from the northern hemisphere um that's a lot and then we can get down here um, there's another one right here um so there's there's like 10 comets 11 comets that are currently visible here in the northern hemisphere um, some of these are actually fizzling out because now we're getting out of March and into April. Uh, but there's quite a bit of comets here, but some of these are very faint, uh, comets. So great for cameras, um, or very large telescopes, but nothing that's quite, you know, whole naked eye visible, you know, break out all the stops and go see it. So, um, give it a try. If you're going to be in totality, see if you can see 12 P Pons Brooks and see if that is something that is, visible but good luck with it um i'm gonna try to see what's there but um i'd be curious to see if you guys get anything out of there but if you ever want to go uh go over to cometchasing.skyhound.com and that's all the comet notes that you're gonna want to know about right there now deep sky there's a lot of things up right now um because we are transitioning from the winter to the spring uh, winter, we have a lot of nebulous objects up there. Um, we still have like the Orion Nebula and the Horsehead Nebula that are visible in the early evening. So let's set that sun. You can see Orion right here um, and Taurus are still kind of hanging out, but they'll be gone by mid-evening um, at this point, and especially by the end of the month, they will be gone. Um, we still have Gemini up there, but after that... Um, we start getting into what I like to call galaxy season, and that's where you're going to have Leo, Leo Minor, Coma Berenices, Virgo, um, Ursa Major, all that. That's all filled with galaxies, and that's because we're looking out of the plane of the Milky Way. Um, so you can see the winter Milky Way sitting up over here, um, but as the month continues on, that is going to start to disappear a little bit more, especially as we get into May. So springtime, at least here in the Northern Hemisphere, is all about galaxies. And uh, you're going to need some big scopes or long focal lengths. But for the early part of the month, you can still go out and you can still catch some of the... Um, you can still catch Orion and the horse head, but they're not going to be visible for much longer. A little bit higher from that... Um, is this guy right here, NGC 2244, which I have, I should have gone through this a little bit more. I apologize because um, it's not in Taurus, it's in Monoceros. Uh, but this is the Rosette Nebula. I'm just going to pan through that really quick. Boop. Let's get over here. Um, this is the Rosette Nebula. The Rosette Nebula is up in Monoceros. And very large object, great for narrowband uh, imaging, especially if you're doing like hydrogen alpha and um, 
oxygen three, so like bicolor imaging, which is what this is, um, or just doing H alpha. Incredibly easy target to get even in town, but it's huge. It's a very large object, so you're gonna need a very wide field optic to catch it. Um, visually, it's fairly faint. You could use like an O3 or a UHC filter. Um, night vision does a very nice job with it. However, again, remember it's quite large. So if you're trying to see all of it, you're gonna need a fairly wide field optic um, at that point. But that's the Rosette Nebula. It's a fun one to go after. It's got the clusters inside of it. Um, imaging wise, there's a lot of structure to work with in there. And you can do Hubble palettes. It's very receptive to the narrow band filters. So go ahead and give that a try. And if you've got some focal length, go in and image certain pieces of it. You don't even have to image the whole thing because there's just all these little dark regions like up in here and down here. And even in the middle, you could zoom in with a larger focal length optic and you could probably get some cool stuff out of it. Wow, I did not read through all of this. I apologize. I'm just going to jump through this. This is the Cone Nebula. The Cone Nebula is also in Montecero, so it's not that far um, from the Rosette Nebula. And actually, if you have a wide enough field and, or are doing a mosaic and you're using hydrogen alpha filters they connect to each other. Um, it's really cool because there's a little stream that comes off the rosette and leads up into uh, the cone nebula or the Christmas tree cluster, which is, this is what it's known as. Um, you can go over there and check that out, but this is another great one. Again, um, it's still up, but we are going to lose it by the end of the month. These are kind of the last major nebulas that are visible, large nebulas that are visible before we lose most of the winter objects and uh, move over into spring. And of course the coming of summer is not far away where we get that summer Milky Way and we get uh, Ophiuchus and Scorpius and Sagittarius and all these Cygnus and all these major constellations that are the coming of the, the uh, summer months. But we're still at the tail end of the winter uh, constellation. So Monoceros and Gemini are usually the last ones to kind of hang out there, finally giving way to Leo and um, your bigger springtime constellations. And of course, within those, uh, we also have Canis Vinactices. We have M106. Um, M106 is about 25 million light years away. You're going to need some dark skies to catch this visually. And the more aperture you've got, the more detail you're going to see. Uh, excuse me, but one thing I like about M106 is it has a few sets of arms. There's the traditional spiral arms that you see here, but it also has those uh, red arms that are material being swept up from the black hole that's in the center of that galaxy. So if you are imaging this, um, I probably would recommend about 800 to 1,000 millimeters or longer. This is a 1,000 millimeter focal length right here at full frame with a 6200 camera. Um, don't be afraid to put some hydrogen alpha detail in there because those red filters are going to let that light from those uh, red arms that the black hole is whipping up in there. The hydrogen alpha filter will help bring some of that detail out. Um, so give it some time on that if you have that capability. It does add a little bit to what we can see in this galaxy but m106 is very cool very dynamic and you can as you can see there's a lot of galaxies in this region because we're in canis Phanactasi or uh, yeah como veronesis i think on this one uh, there's way too many to remember at this point but very dynamic galaxy a uh, very cool one to go after right now there's a ton of galaxies like this too it's not just m106 of course you have m51 the whirlpool galaxy which for whatever reason I don't have a picture of. I will have to change that. Um, but another one that's up right now, so let's just kind of go through this really quick. M106. So you can see M106 is up here in Canis Vinactices. Um, it's technically in Canis Vinactices. Um, it's right on the border there with Ursa Major. But you can see it's sitting right here. Um, a very cool galaxy, lots in the region. But uh, just a little bit below that, or yeah, below it, um, you have the famous Whirlpool Galaxy, or M51. And uh, M51 right here, there we go, 
everyone's probably seen this. M51 is a fantastic galaxy uh, this time of year. Probably one of the most observed. If you've ever seen this in a large Dobsonian telescope, it looks very similar to this. Um, the detail is incredible. It's a face-on spiral galaxy that's actually interacting with its neighbor galaxy. Um, and it's there's so much dust and detail around M51 that it's a great object to image. But the nice thing about it is it's easy to image. You can do this from the backyard. Um, those little thin wisps that are around it that you can see there on Stellarium right there, those require a bit more dark skies, uh, longer exposures. And if you're doing monochrome, very nice luminance data will help bring out that uh, detail there. But that's M106 right or I'm sorry, M106 is what we were talking about. M51 right here is the Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, another great galaxy to go after this time of year. Um, and it's rising. And this is a good one that you can actually image for a while. But very much like M33 that's up in the fall, uh, this has a lot of those red little H2 regions inside of it. Not as big and dynamic as M33s are, but uh, the Whirlpool has a lot of these H2 regions. So if you do have a narrow band hydrogen alpha filter for deep sky, throw in some H alpha time in there and pop those H2 regions out and you can get a little bit more dynamic look um, to your, your galaxy image there. Um, but M51 is a great one to go after. You don't need anything tremendously large in size, especially if you're in a dark sky site, like you might be this weekend, give it a go. Um, but it's a fantastic galaxy to go after. And it's a good one to get acquainted with a more fainter galaxy that looks like it would be bright, but it's a little bit more of a challenge to go after. And of course, not far from that, on the other side, you have M101. Now, M101 is a bit of a challenging galaxy visually. It's very diffuse um, and spread out. I've never really been too happy with much of the views I've seen of it visually until I got into the 20 plus inch aperture categories. Um, and the 28 inch Dob, I've got the M101 is beautiful. And a couple of years ago, we had that. Or was it last year? Might have been last year or the year before we had that supernova in it. Um, I think that was last year, actually. We had the supernova in it, and we were able to see that. Um, but M101 is a very challenging object, despite it being a Messier object. It's doable in smaller telescopes, but if you're trying to get the detail in those outer arms, you need some serious aperture. Don't be afraid to push the magnification a bit. And finally... Um, dark skies is ideal for this. Now, if you're imaging it, it's a lot different story. It's still a fairly easy object, but there's a lot of those H2 regions in there again. So don't be afraid once again, like M33 and M51, to add some of that hydrogen alpha detail in there and pop out those H2 regions. But M101 is another very nice galaxy this time of year. And you can see they're not far from each other. You have M101 here, you have M... 51 down here and then right up here you have m106 they're kind of all in this little group uh hanging out but there's a lot of galaxies up here so here's m106 we did 51 we did 101 uh moving over here um you have a lot of galaxies this is ngc 4151 uh, you can see this has some really nice very faint uh nebulous outer arms and some other companions nearby that are in the field uh, that's another one. And then, of course, you've got this guy down here, the Silver Needle Galaxy. This one's very cool, especially in dark sky sites. None of these over here have a lot of the H2 regions, so this is just straight exposure time. Silver Needle is a very cool one if you have a decent-sized telescope. It just pops out, and it's pretty cool, and it's one of those edge-ons. Um, and it just keeps going, like, like this one right next door from the Silver Needle, if I could get... There we go. No... Anyway, this one's not going to play nice. But there's a ton of stuff over here. And this is what I mean by galaxy season. Is they just pop everywhere. So here's NGC 4395. Um, but the more and more you dig around... Uh, here we go. Uh, here we have the hockey stick and the whale. These two generally fit in the same field of view as each other. So those are cool as well. So if you want to know more, that's NGC 4631. And down here you have NGC uh, 4656. 
Um, but as you can see, the more you peruse this area, it just keeps going. Um, here's the koi fish galaxy, and you see 4559. This one's got a ton of H2 regions in it. You can see all that pink in there. That would be a good one to do hydrogen alpha on as well. And you can just go and go. And of course, this big one right here, a personal favorite of mine and a lot of deep sky observers. This is NGC 4565. Um, this looks like a UFO just going through the field of view. This is a big galaxy and it's a very cool one. And you can do this one from in town as well. But of course, dark skies works better um, photographically, but imaging or visual wise, a lot of these would benefit from darker skies and decent aperture. But you can see it just keeps going and going. And this is why I say it's galaxy season. There's all kinds of stuff in here. Here's a galaxy cluster right here. Um, NGC 4874. It doesn't stop. Um, it just galaxies upon galaxies. And that's what the springtime is about. That's why if you have a large aperture telescope, I'd probably say 12 inch or larger. The spring, if you are into galaxies, is the time to get out to those dark sky sites and check it all out. Sorry, my camera decided to have a mind of its own. Um, but yeah, it just keeps going. And that was just Ursa Major, Canis Venactis, and Coma Berenices. When we get down to Virgo, you have the Virgo cluster. And we'll get more into that in May when this gets a little bit higher. But Virgo is packed with galaxies as well. It just keeps going. We could spend a whole hour on just talking about some of this stuff. So, um, But anyway, that all started with M106. Now, another one that's up right now, this was actually a totem target last year, is Hickson 61, the box. Um, this is in Coma Berenices. There's actually four galaxies in here, and they range in distance. So 200 million light years is starting. Um, this is a larger aperture object. I'd probably say about 12 inches or bigger. The bigger, the better for this particular object. Uh, dark skies would be required. Now, imaging, you could do this in town, but you're going to lose a lot of that contrast. But... You really want to try to do this in dark skies, and there's a bunch of other galaxies in the field in there as well, but that's Hickson 61 would be the box galaxies right there, and that one's a cool one to go after just because you have those galaxies and they form a box, but um, the whole collection in there all ranges in distance, but one of them is NGC 4174, if you want to try and find something. And the nice thing about this is it goes overhead at Zenith. So that's something you want to think about right there because you get a lot of imaging time on this particular cluster of galaxies. So if you want to go really deep um, exposures with this, you've got a lot of time with uh, Hickson 61 because here in the Northern Hemisphere, it pretty much goes overhead through Zenith and you've got some considerable amount of time to go after them. But again, this was one of our objects, uh, target of the month last year. So go after it this year and see if, what you can find, but it's a really cool one. Now, I'm not huge on galaxies because a lot of them look fuzzy, so I like to throw nebulas in where I can, which gets really challenging this time of year because there's no major nebulas in the area. Um, but there are a few if you know where to look. Um, Hydra would be the constellation if you want to dig out some of these little planetaries. And these are fainter planetaries because they're part of the Abel catalog. Um, but the first one would be Abel 33, which looks a lot like a diamond ring. Um, this is in Hydra, about 2,700 light years away. This is a dark sky target. Uh, most Abel planetaries, if you're doing it visually, are dark sky targets. So... Uh, particularly with these, a lot of them would benefit from an O3 filter. If you don't have an O3 filter for visual, use a UHC. But O3 is your best friend and a decent size scope, probably 12 inch minimum. Um, but the more aperture, the better. Now, a lot of these Abel planetaries are fairly easy to do with a camera. Um, eight, these are all hydrogen alpha shots that you're seeing right here. But O3 is very beneficial as well. Um, but with those narrowband filters, you're able to cut through some of the city lights, particularly with hydrogen alpha and get a hold of some of these. But this is a Bell 33 again in Hydra. Uh, so that's a fun one to go after if you're looking for something that's very spherical, little planetary, looks like a little bubble floating up there, but it's a cool one to go after. Of course, not too far away and a tad bit fainter also in Hydra is a Bell 34, um, much, much fainter, um, 
You can see this one is not as receptive to the hydrogen alpha filter, so it'd probably be best with O3 or mix the two. But again, also on Hydra, a little bit closer at 2,400 light years away. Again, dark skies. And if you're trying to image it, use those narrow bands, uh, especially the hydrogen alpha and the oxygen three. Your sulfur filters are worthless uh, when it comes to planetaries. There's just not much there. Um, some of the bigger and brighter ones you could probably use an S2 filter on, but so a lot of these Abel ones do not have a lot of sulfur content inside of them. So the sulfur filter, if you've got it, don't bother doing a Hubble palette on these. I wouldn't say don't bother because if I said don't bother, we might not be able to experiment and see what is actually out there. So give it a go. But uh, there's a good chance that you're not going to have a lot of signal come through with that. Probably very little um, on these nebulas. You probably see a little bit, particularly on this one. If you notice, it has some of the brighter lobes in it. You'll see kind of up here at the top left and down here at the right. Um, it's got some of these little brighter sections. You might be able to pull some S2 out of that. But ideally, these planetary nebulas work best with hydrogen alpha and oxygen three filters and if you are looking to get an oxygen three narrow band for imaging i would recommend that you get as narrow as you can afford or as narrow as your system will allow um, hydrogen alpha filters are not really hindered too much by light pollution and the moon because that particular frequency of light is not in that part of the spectrum now, O3 sits in that green, bluish part of the spectrum, and moonlight and lots of light pollution emit in those frequencies. So if you want to get the most out of it, that's why I would recommend going as narrow as you can afford. Um, I would probably recommend starting at 5 nanometers or narrower if you're looking for something. 6 would be okay, but the more narrow you can afford, the better. But when it comes to narrow band filters, I actually find I don't like the sulfur filters. Um, there's just not much up there and they cost the exact same amount as the other two. So I would, if it were me giving recommendations, get a nice hydrogen alpha filter, probably something around seven, eight nanometers is probably the widest I'd recommend. Uh, five is probably my favorite because it's right in the middle. Um, five or six nanometers is pretty good. Um, for all around use three nanometers are really extreme and if you need it go get it uh, but when it comes to o3 i would recommend five nanometers bare minimum but if you can swing that three nanometer uh, bandpass filter it's it's definitely worth the investment and if you're not going to buy the sulfur to take the money that you save from not buying a sulfur filter and apply that to the highest quality o3 you can afford so that would be my recommendation for shooting planetaries and other nebulas like this, but it's all up to you. Um, I'm not going to say don't go buy an S2 filter. They're, they do have their place. They're just There's not a lot of it in the nighttime sky at this point to benefit from the Sulfur 2, in my opinion, in the amount of hundreds of thousands of dollars you might spend on that particular filter. You could apply to something you'd use more, but that's just from my personal experience. Um, so we're going to change some things up on Totem because Totem is getting bigger, which is great. Now, if you don't know about Totem, Totem is the target of the month here at Skywatcher. And if you want to know what's going on for that target, um, you can go to skywatcherusa.com, go under media and hit target of the month. Now, how target of the month works, if you're not familiar with it, and uh, as of this recording, because it is March 28th. Uh, we still have several days left before the month ends. Um, but this one, we give you a target each month. We pick a target. We try to make it challenging to some extent. You can see some of these are pretty elusive targets. Um, and that's the point, is to get you to get off the, the typical stuff and get off, go off the beaten path and find something cool to actually take pictures of. Now, this month, it's Jones Emerson 1, also known as the Headphone Nebula. Um, I'm letting all of you know right now that because we had to pre-record this episode, we will not be showing any of the totem entries for March on this webcast because not all the entries are put in. Now, that also leads to another conversation that um, 
we're going to be changing now because we, as you can see right here, we have the imaging contest going as well. And first place is $3,000 credit to our online store, $1,000 credit for second place, and $500 for third place. Now, the way you enter Totem is you have to take a picture of the target that we state in that month. You need to provide an image of it, what you took it with, all the specs if you can, and this only applies to the U.S. and Canada. We do not ship all over the world for this, unfortunately, but all the rules are right here, all stated right here. So there's a lot of questions about the rules. They're all here. Now, each year that we do Totem, there's a different patch. This was 22 when we first started. There's not a lot of 22 patches out there in the world. Uh, 23 was the first year we did it all the way through. And of course, this year is the 25th anniversary of Skywatcher, so we have the Totem 2024 patch. So there are three patches in existence now. And um, those of you uh, who have sent in your submissions, we have shipped everything. Um, so there should be no more backlogs of patches hanging around anymore. Um, so everyone should have their patches now. And the, some of you who have already sent them in should be getting your first set of the 2024 patches as well um, excuse me <laughs> allergies um, so that's what you get you submit your target shot and in return we will send you one of our uh, the patch of the year um, and you'll get that and that's what you get every month so if you do it 12 times and you submit an image every month you're gonna get the same patch every month um, these do have adhesives so you can stick them on things but they're full patches um, which is kind of cool. And then, of course, at the end of the month, we are going to pick some of the best images of the month, of the year, and that will go into our uh, judges that we are going to have, and they will pick from that batch. Now, what we are going to change with target of the month is usually we unveil um, every, every month we unveil here on the webcast um, the new target, which is some we're going to keep doing, but there are so many entries now that we're not able to show every entry every month. So what's going to happen is we're going to start picking the best images of the month and putting that in the presentation um, and showcasing the best images of the month. Now, if you entered your and it checks all the boxes you're still going to get a patch but just because you send in your image doesn't mean it'll make it onto the webcast we just don't there's so many entries now that we're not able to just show all these entries all the time so we'll figure out a way to display all the entries but for now because the more entries we get it makes our program longer and it won't fit within the our time slot along with everything else that we're going to be doing so um moving forward only the best images will be placed on the uh, What's Up webcast and presented. Um, but everyone who entered, and if it meets all the specifications, you will get a patch. Now let's talk about April's target of the month. We went back and forth on trying to figure out how we were going to do this um, and what target we're going to do and all that. So we finally just decided to boil it down because there's a bunch of other people who aren't normally astrophotographers and we have people who want these patches. So we thought we would relax it a little bit um, and kind of keep it on brand. So this time for this month, target of the month is the solar eclipse. Now, to be fair, we know a large portion of us will not be on the center line. So for this month, just to make it uh, good for everybody, any phase it doesn't have to be totality you just need a picture of the eclipse in some way shape or form of course we will be picking the best images to present in the may what's up presentation and those images will also be the ones sent in to our judges at the end of the year to pick the first second and third place winners of um of the contest there but um we understand there's going to be a lot of submissions for it but this will hopefully give a chance for people who don't normally do astrophotography a a chance to get the patch and b 
it just makes it a little bit more obtainable and more fun for people. But then once we get back into May, we're going to start picking those elusive targets again. Um, but again, because there's so many entries coming in now, we're only going to be picking a handful of the best images each month now and showcasing them. So great that it's successful, but it's a lot to keep track of um, and post everyone's stuff here. Um, so April's 2024 target of the month is the solar eclipse. Um, totality is obviously the goal, but to, in order to get the patch, it does not have to be in totality. Um, we don't want to exclude millions of other people um, at that point. So anyway, uh, that's pretty much it for this month. Uh, and that's what's up for the month. Uh, if you like what you see here, please go ahead and subscribe. Leave a like on a video. Uh, if you have an idea for a video, please email us at info at skywatchusa.com and title it What's Up. Let us know what your idea is. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, April Night Skies. There's all kinds of stuff going on. Um, I hope all of you have a great time at the eclipse. Please, 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 please be safe. Um, and yeah, next week... We're going to talk about something that you don't hear about too much. It's something that I do, um, and I've had a lot of people ask about before. Um, please also understand that the next episode, which will be airing on April 12th, will be a live episode. We'll be back um, from the eclipse. It'll be a live episode, but we're going to be talking private astronomy events for profit now, I do outreach all the time. I do it for schools. I do all kinds of stuff. There's a big difference between doing educational outreach and being hired to do private events where you're basically just part of the entertainment package um, of an event. I do this on the side. It's a nice way to make your equipment make money for you. Um, but there are some major caveats behind it too that you need to take into consideration. And I've had enough people ask me about how to get started doing this that it's probably worth doing a whole episode on. But it's a nice way to get your equipment making money for you. Maybe a good way to write off equipment or get out and advertise some equipment you've got. You can make good partnerships that way. But I'm going to tell you guys how to do that. And I'm also going to tell you the things that you need to consider before starting some kind of business like that, because there are some things that you don't hear about until you're in it, and they are important factors for you to think about um, before going down this rabbit hole and working with event planners and doing things like that. So um, we're going to go ahead and talk about that. Um, other than that, I hope you have a great weekend. Um, it is new moon weekend. Get out and do some viewing. If you are at the Texas Star Party event, stop by, say hi. Um, some of you probably have already stopped by and say hi by the time this is aired, uh, but stop by and say hi. And of course, in a couple weeks after this, we have Neef, um, and we should have some cool stuff to show you guys there as well. So, Thank you very much, guys. Please have a safe weekend. Enjoy the eclipse. Absolutely be safe. I'm excited to see all your guys' pictures. Um, but other than that, we will see you guys um, after the eclipse next Friday. We'll be back live. And uh, please have a great time. Clear skies. Stay safe. And we will see you guys next week. See ya. Bye.